Hallelujah. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? I love the response. So, okay, I think the seating arrangement is not bad, but I would have said, um, I mean, we can just fill up the MC seat in front of us so we can communicate better. You know, so I don't have to start walking. I mean, just just try to fill up the MC seat in front of you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Are you ready for God's word tonight? Come on, that doesn't sound like you're ready. Are you ready for God's word tonight? Are you ready for God's word tonight? Romans chapter 14 and verse 7. Romans 14 and verse 7. So we are communicating tonight, so don't be cold on me. We are preaching together, amen? Yeah. Romans 14 and verse... Romans 14, 17, yeah. Romans 14, 17. It was on the screen just now. Media, no spoil my ministry this evening. Amen. So let's read this like a mass choir. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Glory! Glory! Can we do this one more time? Can we do this one more time? You see, you can't read that you have joy in the Holy Ghost and you are not joyful. So there's an attitude you give when you say, the kingdom of God is enjoying the Holy Ghost. So as you shout it, you are intentional about it. Let's read one more time. One, two, three, go. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Come on, say to your name, I have joy in the Holy Ghost. Come on, say it like you mean it. I have joy in the Holy Ghost. See, preach to your neighbor. Say, I have joy in the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you, but I have joy in the Holy Ghost. Father, I ask that you do what only you can do in this service tonight. Throw your weight in this building. Give me utterance and boldness as you give your people understanding. Let Jesus be glorified. Let the people let be edified and let the devil be terrified. For in Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. For in Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. So um, for the past three weeks, people have been dealing um, with the gospel series. And it has been an amazing teaching so far. If you've been blessed by the gospel spirits, can you just like wave your hands? Yeah, the gospel spirits has been an amazing teaching so far. And P. Flo did an amazing job. P. Flo taught us wonderfully. He established what the gospel is to us. And by, and by now, I believe that we all can actually preach the gospel to people. Right? Uh -uh. <laughs> you guys didn't sound sure of yourself. So by now, you should be able to preach the gospel to people, right? Yeah. So I'll be reiterating just a point or two about what people shared and we're just going to travel from there. And why it's important that we, we, we reiterate what the gospel is, is because the gospel is the diet of the believer. The gospel is something you need to keep hearing and keep hearing. It's not something you just want to hear. It's not a one-off meal. Do you understand? It's something you want to keep hearing and keep hearing. That's why Paul in Philippians 3 and verse 1 said, to write the same thing unto you again, Unto me it is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Paul is not saying I'm going to write something different to you. He said to write the same thing unto you again. Meaning the gospel is one message. It has to be repeatedly taught. It's not something you teach once and begin to teach other things. The gospel is something we teach all the time. So Paul is saying to write the same thing unto you again. Unto me it is not grievous. But for you, it is safe. Because the gospel is something you need to commit to memory. Yeah, that's why um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 2 says, the gospel that saves you, you should keep it in memory unless you have believed in vain. But if you treasure the gospel that saved you, it's something you want to keep in memory. It's something you want to keep hearing and keep hearing. You see, if, um, if you can put your song on repeat in your playlist, I believe you should put the gospel in your memory on repeat. Right? If you can put a song on your playlist on repeat, you should put the gospel on repeat in your memory. Because it's something you need to keep listening and keep listening to. The Bible says I, I, I am in Acts 20, 32 that I, um, I, 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 I recommend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among the saints. So the gospel is what gives you inheritance among the saints. The gospel is what builds you up. So it's something you want to keep hearing 
and keep hearing. And one of the things people shared that was powerful that I'll be read tonight is that the gospel is not a threat message. The gospel is a love letter. Yeah. Because it is important we have this in mind. Religion has messed the gospel up so much that they've presented the gospel to be a threat message. See, nothing about the gospel suggests fear, threats, condemnation, or guilt to us. Right? From the definition of what gospel is, gospel means good news. So there is no way a good news can bring fear to the person receiving the good news. Right? What good news should do to the person receiving it is to create in him excitement, happiness, joy, right? So from the definition of what gospel is, it doesn't suggest that the message that should come from it should communicate fear to the hearers. So it's just amazing how religion has twisted everything and made it look like the real message of God's grace, the real message of the gospel should just scare you. I mean, that's some kind of manipulation. That's why you need to understand that the gospel is not a threat message. The gospel is a love letter. The gospel is God's love letter to the world. So God wanted to send a love letter. I mean, you know the way you toast ladies now, guys? I mean, see, I'm not talking about the guys that toast ladies with violence. Yeah, I'm talking about the guys that have sense, actually. You know, you, you come in a very gentle way. If you are trying to get the girl and she's not being, you know, responsive, you send flowers, you're kind with your words, you know, you, you, just, you just want to act sweet. You can't talk to someone and be saying, if you don't date me, you will die. If I'm that, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm that lady, I will just I will shift from you. Yeah, so this is God trying to toast us into the kingdom, into the fold. So why do you think it should come with violence? God is not a man of war, he's a man of love. God is not in Daboski. Yeah. He's the one that is man of war. God is, not, God is a man of love. The Bible said God is love. So God cannot bring the gospel to you. God cannot, God, God wants to bring you into the fold and he's trying to threaten. No, God doesn't threaten us into the fold. He loves us into the fold. Do you understand that? He doesn't threaten us into the fold. He loves us into the fold. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that leadeth men into repentance. Not the fear of hell. Not the... I mean, you know them now. You listen to them. So why are you looking at me like this? <laughs> right? Do you understand that? And one of the... Um, like I said, there is no part of the gospel that suggests threats, condemnation, fear to us. One of the angle of the gospel that has suffered in the hands of religion eh, is the message of rapture. See, I'm a pastor's kid. I've heard all sorts of message only in the name of rapture. <laughs> There's actually one video I watched. Um, people can be so funny actually. Sha. So the woman said in this vision that God showed her um, after the, tr I mean, I'm trying to laugh. <laughs> the trumpets, I mean, it was on the last day, then the rapture day, people were now going up to heaven already. Then when they got to the sky, Jesus now saw that the water roses. He now said, go back to, I mean, how does that actually make a normal sense, not to talk of spiritual sense. So, they're actually trying to say, Jesus did not know that they were coming up with roses, that he had to wait for them to come to the sky. And I mean, I, it's just, I mean, how do people just come up with stuff and they just, it's a, it's a mystery, Ah, It's crazy. We've, we've heard all sorts in the name of rapture, you know. Are you, will you be ready? And they just scare us. And it's just crazy how religion has messed up the message of rapture. But we understand that the Bible cannot mean to us today 
what it did not mean to its original audience. So the Bible gives us a clear explanation on what the message of rapture is. A concept cannot be interpreted differently in different dispensations. So we cannot say, okay, even if that's what it meant in the days of Paul, it is meaning the same thing today. No, the interpretation of the scriptures remains consistent throughout all ages, throughout all times, throughout all seasons, throughout all situations. So situation, circumstances, age, time cannot change a concept in the scripture. Do we understand that? So let's see how Paul explained what rapture should do to the believer. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of, an arch, of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Next verse. Then, which, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. This is where the concept of rapture was actually gotten from. So we won't find the word rapture in the scripture nowhere. Genesis to Revelation. But the reason why theologians brought it into the fold is because it explains a concept that we see in the scripture. So this cut up here explains the experience of rapture. Now this is Paul saying that um, cut up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now let's see what this message should do. Next verse. I want all of us to read this together. I mean, I, I think we are all educated here. So, one, two, three, go. What should we do with these words? Scare one another. Condemn one another. But comfort one another. So, the message of rapture is the message of comfort. Do you understand that? The message of rapture is a message of comfort. That we are sure that on that last day, God will carry us. No worry. It is not a, it's, it's not a, see, rapture is not a prayer point. Rapture is our reality. The day we got born again, we became rapturable. Nothing can change. The, see, take it back. Let me show you something. Take to the previous verse. See, this is a reality that Paul already established. He said, which we are alive and remain shall be caught up. It is already certain. For the believer, we shall be caught up. We are not praying to be caught up. It is a reality. We will be caught up. Do you understand? It's not something we should be scared about that, ah, on that day, will Jesus carry me? Let me, let me, let me tell you something. The Bible says Christ is the head. And we are his body. Christ cannot go to heaven and leave his body here on earth. Do you understand that? If Christ is the head. And we are his body. So if Christ is ascending to heaven. We only the head go. The body has to go. It is, it's not debatable. It's not negotiable. It's what will happen. So the Bible is saying we should comfort one another with these words. That don't worry, brother. So how do you comfort people with this message of rapture? When, when, we are going through, when we are going through trying times, I just come to meet you. Pastor Philip, don't worry. This word, the, the softness in this word is just like small potatoes compared to the glory that is coming. Even if we are passing through our times, don't worry. We are coming into a time where there is no, going to be, there, there is no pain, no, so, no sorrow, no stress, no sickness. Everything is just going to be all right. Yeah, that's how we comfort one another with the message of rapture. Don't worry. Christ is coming soon. Christ is, we, we go leave this sofa, sofa head. We go leave this body in Nigeria. Don't worry. Everything will steal. That's how we should comfort one another. Not saying, if you don't give your life to Christ, if God just comes. It is, listen, the message of rapture shouldn't be a horror movie. Stop scaring people with it. If there is any class of movie at all, the message of rapture should fall in. It should be a love movie. Yeah. It shouldn't be a horror movie. You, why people look like me? I don't know what love movie looks like. See, all these Korean, all these Z-word people. 
does she make you watch zero? Yeah, if there's any f- category of movie class, the message of rapture should actually fall into, it should be the class of the love movie. Because actually, it's act- the message of rapture is actually saying the groom is coming to take simple. I mean, so, so, I mean you're, you're the only couple married I, you're the only married couple I know here. If you are calling her that, babe, I'm coming to take you on a date. Is she always scared? If you are in a relationship where the husband or your boyfriend calls you and say, babe, I'm coming home this night and you are scared, there's something wrong with that relationship. It's an abusive relationship. I can't even, there's one woman like that, eh? One woman like that, that if I tell her that, let's go out and she agrees. There's way my beloved used to do me one kind. You know, no. <laughs> if this, I mean, it's, <laughs> no, I mean that, that should be the reality. <laughs> Not to talk of when it is the reverse. So if I'm feeling that way, how much more that woman? Do we understand? It is that simple. It's clear now. <laughs> when I involve the woman, I shall do your eye. <laughs> Hallelujah. Do we understand that? Are we learning something? So I wrote it. You can't claim to hear or understand the gospel and you are not joyful. It will be a question of what did you hear? And as a preacher, you can't claim to be preaching the gospel. And the people you are preaching to are not joyful. It will be a question of what are you preaching? Okay, I mean, how many of okay, we indicated that we were around during the gospel series? So let me ask you a question. When people were preaching, preaching the gospel, how are you feeling? I mean, how, how does it feel to know that all your sins are forgiven? That you are accepted in the beloved? You don't have to perform to belong because you are accepted in the beloved. How do you feel to know that you have been redeemed? You are called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God loves you more than the devil hates you. God is no mad at you. God is madly in love with you. How will they do you for Bele? So you can't, you can't claim to hear the gospel and you are not joyful. I need to ask you, what did you actually hear? Because the gospel brings joy all the time. The gospel brings joy to the hearers all the time. I mean, all the time. All the time. It is important that we have this mentality or this teaching at the back of our mind because um, if there's something that we lack in the church today, especially in the in churches where the gospel is not accurately taught. That thing is the joy of the believer. If there's something that the church lacks today, is the joy of the believer. Religion has ripped us of our joy. That is even a crime now to come into church rejoicing. It's a crime to come into church being happy excited, they now term it as you are, you are carnal. Haven't you heard that before? That no, no, ah, no, don't, why are you, ah, why are you smiling too much? You, f- you now do your face like ampice, you, s- you squeeze. Yeah. See, I am a pastor, I say it again, I'm a pastor's kid, I've been to church all my life. It is... <laughs> The Bible says in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. So why are they bringing the opposite to us? The, the, uh, the proof that we are in God's presence is that we are joyful. The house of the Lord is not a morning center. 
The house of the Lord is not a burial ground. We shouldn't bring that experience to church. We should be joyful people. Say, I'm a joyful person. I am full of joy. I'm a joyful person. I am full of joy. It's, 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 God has blessed me with both physical joy and spiritual joy. If you don't get it, just forget about it. Because you know, so, sometimes now, so, some people just call to ask me that, Pastor Lai, how are you? My response is, I am joyful. Because <laughs> I have both physical joy and spiritual joy. Why? <laughs> People, people joke so much. <laughs> if you know what the physical journey is, if you don't know. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the, God, the, the religion has, has ripped us of our joy that we now leave church fearful instead of living joyful. And I've heard in time, I mean, I've heard this all over again, that the, the church has lost the move of the Spirit. The church has lost the fear of God. There is no more move of the Spirit in the church. And what do they call that move of the Spirit? Where people are crying. Where people are weeping. Where there is gnashing of teeth. The only place the Bible recorded that there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth is hellfire. Ah, is the church hellfire? Are we pastor feeling right? Because, are we... <laughs> Am, am I wrong? The only place the Bible recorded that it shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth is hellfire. Why are we bringing an experience to the church? So I saw, I saw a funny writer. I, I'm going to read it to you. Very funny. I mean, I, I, I found it very funny because it is very funny. Let me read it to you. You will laugh. I, I bet you you will laugh. So this person said, in ancient times, I mean, the person was trying to compare the move of the spirits in ancient times and now that's, ah, in the days of our fathers, God used to move very well, but now God is no more moving. So let's see what this person, <laughs> let's see what this person calls the move of God. So he said in ancient times, People answer to altar calls with tears rolling down their faces with weeping and there's no, you don't like that of this. Let me know. Let me not see what it not say. With weeping and they are remorseful. You know, and we've heard it times and times again from people that you are not forgiving because you are remorseful. You are forgiving because he is merciful. So it's not your remorse that hand you your forgiveness. No. God moved to the cross to die for you before you ever be, before you ever thought of being remorseful. While you were yet seen as Christ died for us. Another, another, um, another scripture said, while we were enemies with God. So your, your remorse, your, uh, they call that in, um, what is it, um, when you, you know, when you owe someone something and you go to repay it, well, Restitution here, thank you. Your remorse, your restitution. All of those things doesn't move God. It doesn't. Highest to do it to move you. It's not past this roof. Eh -eh. So people should just calm down with this. I'm still reading these guys. So, so he said in ancient times, people once had to a lot of call with tears rolling down from their faces, with weeping, and they are being remorseful. But it is not so today again. Where is the move of God? This is the one that even shocked me past. In the old, sinners go home weeping. Sinners go home crying. Sinners go home with sorrow in their heart because they felt like they've offended God. But in the church today, sinners go home rejoicing. That is the response. See, that is what actually changed. See, the age of a lie doesn't make it truth. 
that it has been happening in times past doesn't mean that is the that is the standard. See, longevity is not legality. It might have been for a thousand years. It doesn't make it true. It might have been happening for a million years. It doesn't make it true. I know that the the transitioning might actually be be. I mean, it's been for so long, and when we try to change it, see, sometimes, eh, in the school of ignorance, truth is a rebellion. Do we understand that? In an institution of ignorance, truth is a rebellion. That means when ignorance has stayed in a place for a very long time, and people have, have adapted to that ignorance... When you try to introduce the truth, it looks like you are trying to fight against what they consider as the truth. So it becomes a rebellion. But regardless of the age of the lie, it doesn't make it truth. That people, sinners were going home weeping and with sorrow, then doesn't mean that is the standard. I will show you in the scriptures just now. Give me a minute. Luke 10. Luke 15, verse 7 and verse 10. I love this. This is Jesus speaking. Oh. Let's know if we respect Jesus over the traditions of our fathers. Jesus speaking, he said, I say unto you that likewise, why is this getting in my pain? That likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repented. So if there is joy in heaven over that sinner, why should that sinner be weeping? Shouldn't it be joyful? Shouldn't that sinner be rejoicing also? Does it make any sense? Am I making sense? Give me verse 10. Jesus said it again for the second time. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. So if angels are rejoicing over one sinner that repents, why should the sinner be, re be weeping and be sorrowful? Shouldn't the sinner also rejoice? Ask me now. I be, I'm saying nonsense. Exactly. So why is this person saying that in times past, these guys go home weeping, but now they go home rejoicing? And that is what they call the move of God. This is the move of God here. Rejoicing in the spirit is the move of God. Rejoicing is the move of God. So I, I don't understand how... See, sinners don't want to be reminded that they are sinners. They know. Give them the gospel. They don't want to... Uh, see, there was a time that... They've preached condemnation to me so much that, eh, me and my friends, we just walked out of church one day. We just said, it's in this heavenly race. Now, only God go run now. And only God run your race by yourself. Because it felt like nobody can actually go to this heaven we are talking about. Do you understand? It felt like hard, hard work. This is a heavenly race, Baba. If I say, I see you day heaven, you like I'm alone. Just day. It was that hard. But thank God for the gospel. Thank God for the revelation of Jesus. Ah, religion is a bastard. There was one day in church. So, um, in my dad's church, he invited a guest minister to come and, and call a seven-day revival. You know, and I think the third day of the revival or so, that was when I was chance to come. And before the man started preaching, he had led powerful prayers. I mean, in a religious setting, what is powerful prayer is praying against your family, causes, and all of those things, killing your enemy. And the ignorance in me then, I prayed it with all passion. I mean, I prayed my life out. And I was speaking in tongues then. So, in the midst of the prayer... I was speaking in tongues. People could see me praying with passion, praying with all boldness. And time for the word came. The man started preaching. After the man downloaded about 23 things that can take you to hell. And I, and I looked at myself again. I said, 
after preaching, I said, so if you want to give your life to Christ, come out. So in my mind, I mean, I was already feeling guilty. I already felt like coming out to give my life to Christ again because I took it some minutes ago in his preaching. So, but in my mind, I was like, ah, but people have seen me pray passionately. I was even speaking in tongues. So I will not come outside now that I want to give my life to Christ. People will not be saying, ah, is this not the brother that was praying? Ah, he was even speaking in tongues. So he's not even born again. So he has been pretending. Do you, do you, do, I mean, do you understand that kind of thing? Religion messes up with your mind. That it makes you question your salvation. It makes you look like God didn't do a finished work. Maybe said, I, I don't do my own. Do your own. Maybe God said, Jesus said, to be continued. You know, religion is, I can go on and on explaining my experience, but my experience is not the gospel. So leave my experience alone. Let's listen to the gospel. Are you getting blessed? So I, I mentioned that you can't hear the gospel and not be joyful. And I said that the scriptures should be our source of conviction. Not one man's experience. Not one man's teaching. Do we understand that? Before I show you something, I want to show you something in Acts chapter 8. But, okay, 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 okay. I, I won't miss this part. I won't miss this part. So, back then in school, um, still with the story of where is the power of God, where is the move of God. So, my lecturer back then said to me, or said to the class, that because we, he was talking to pastors, actually, I was I was doing pastors, I was doing pastors training back then. So he said to us in the class that as we are leaving this institution, we should try to bring back the power of God into the church. That the church has lost the power of God, the church has lost the move of the spirit, and he used the story of one God's general. I don't know if Pastor Philip knows the name. Um, story of one God's general. He said this man held a crusade back then, and after one week of the crusade, people were still in the crusade crowd, crying, weeping, saying, God, unless you touch me, I will not, you know, that kind of drama. I mean, and it's not bad that people want to spend time in the house of the Lord, right? But we need to know what is actually keeping them there. So, when the man actually told us the theme of that Crusade. Ah, no wonder they were there for one week. What is the theme of the crusade? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Why they no go there for that crusade? Why they go one come out? Do you understand? Because all I can think of in that crusade is the man go, the man would have threatened their life out. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. What would be the message? God is mad at you. If you don't repent, you will die. You will rot in hell. You repent today. Why would they want to leave the crusade ground? Why? Because they feel like, oh, my, make I not go live, make God not go kill you. That is the mentality. Do you understand? So, I, it's, I, 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 see, I can't even understand anymore how that should now be the message of the church. Seeing us in the hands of a loving God, thank you. That should be the message. Our God is a loving father. Our God is not Shongo, he's not Amadioa. He's a loving father. God doesn't, like I said, God doesn't threat us into the kingdom. He loves us into the kingdom. He can't. I'm done with those guys, I beg. So let's see something in Acts chapter, Act chapter 8, 5 to 8. Let's see what the gospel did to the errors. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached what? Come and stay with me. And preached what? Meaning he preached the gospel because the gospel is the message of Christ, right? Next verse. And the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake. Meaning they, meaning they believed the gospel. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Next verse. For unclean spirits crying out with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that we are lame, we are healed. Now, before you go to the next verse, I want us to read this verse together. Next verse. One, two, go. Sorry. 
So which one is the truth? This one or that sinner? Sinner's one and this one. Because we get our conviction from the scriptures, not from one man's experience, not from one man's ministry. That should not be the standard. And there was great joy in that city. Come on. You can't hear the gospel and not be joyful. The gospel brings joy. The gospel doesn't bring condemnation, doesn't bring fear. It brings joy. I can go on, I can go on. It brings joy. Stop bringing threats to the church. The gospel should bring joy. Simple. And there was great joy in that city because Christ and the gospel was preached. Simple. Case closed. It's not that hard. Are you getting, are you getting something? Am I preaching good? Am I trying? Be careful. Hallelujah. So, our, our um, opening text said, the kingdom is in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I'm glad the Bible did not say fear of the Holy Ghost. That would suggest to us that there is a part of God that has fear. The Bible was specific that the core of the kingdom is righteousness. Peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Like I said, I'm glad the Bible did not say fear of the Holy Ghost. The Bible already recorded that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. So any message that claims to be coming from God cannot be dispensing fear in the hearts of people. God has not given us the spirit of fear. So why should a messenger from God be giving the people the spirit of fear? Does it make any sense? If God himself established that, he has not given us the spirit of fear. Why is someone who claims to be a messenger of God giving the people the spirit of fear? It questions your call as a man of God. It questions who, who sent you. Who actually sent you? Now God or be now God. Because there's God and there is God. Let's know who sends you. So the Bible says, hmm. I hope you get this. The Bible says there is no fear in love. And the Bible says God is love. Meaning there is no fear in God. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casted out fear. Established. And the Bible says God is love. Meaning there is no fear in God. So any church gathering that fear is present, it means God is not present there. God is absent because God is love. So God can't be love. And in the presence of God's children, fear is present. No, that means there is something that has. Now, go school, I mean, help me. There is something that has just tampered with the God. Just, you know, the Bible says it's not a minor deviation. It's, it's, no, you know, it's not as tiny as it may look, it's not a minor deviation. It's a, it's a lie about God. It's a no message. The, the message translation says it. It's a lie about God. It's another gospel. Any church that is bringing fear to the people is, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if it's not a church of God. Mm, because the Bible says there is no fear in love, and God is love, meaning there can't be fear in God. So any church gathering that's, it is fear. That was your take home from that service. And you know what I'm pained? We still go back to that kind of church again. After they've given us some blow of fear. And we know that we left that service fearful. We'll still, it's just like an abusive relationship. That a guy keeps beating you, but you can't leave. No be juju be that. Because people now, not true now. When your friend, the friend that you know, 
Eh? When she begins to tell you the story of how the guy beats her too much, and they're trying to tell her that, leave the relationship now. And she was like, but I love him. But I still love him. He cares for me. He does the... Oh, you don't go ask the gay. Is something wrong with your head? Like, sorry, are you smoking some cheap weed, though? I, it's, it can't be normal. So I just feel like there is, there is something that religion just places in our minds that is just hard to leave. But I tell you, the gospel can flush it out. The gospel can flush it out. Do you know why? Do you know why sometimes it is hard to get that veil off your mind? The Bible says in, I think in First Corinthians or so, that when Moses is read, the veil covers their face. But the moment we turn our focus to Christ, the veil is taken out of the way. So the reason why it is not easy to take out that thing, religion placed in our minds, because we are still focusing on the law. Moses represents the law. We are still in the treadmill of religion. I want to perform. I want to do something. But the moment you embrace grace, which is Jesus, that veil will be t- 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 go, t- go born. But we are still trying to talk. see. Stop flirting with the law. You are in a relationship with Jesus. Stop flirting with the law. Stop flirting with the law. Just stay with Christ and let your life be transformed. As we behold Him, we are changing into the same image from glory to glory. Stay with, tell your neighbor, stay with Christ. Stop stressing, Pastor. Ah, say, are you scared? They really give you blow. Stay, stay, stay with Christ. Stop stressing, Pastor. Because at the end of the day, when you've gone to all your... You still come and miss Pastor Flourish again and he has to lay hands on you. I'm just stressing the man of God. He has so many. He has family now. He has London Church. He has Milan Church. He has a, a Abuja Church. I think I'll give him a rest now. Put you stay, stay in church. Stay in one place. Mm. Joseph. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's see the first time fear was introduced in the early church. Let's see the reaction. Let's see what happened. For us to know that fear should not be present in the church. Give me Acts chapter 5. From 11 to 13, 11 and 13. Okay, you know what? Uh, should I do this? Should I do this? So, the first time fear was introduced in the early church was when Peter killed Ananias and Sapphira. And people struggle with this knowledge because they feel like it was God who killed Ananias and Sapphira. But it wasn't God actually. It was Peter that killed Ananias and Sapphira. It is so clear in the scriptures. If you can give me from verse 9 in the NLT, let me show you. We travel from there. So, this Peter is some kind of rude guy though. And Peter said, he had just killed Ananias. Yeah, so he continued. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? This young man who buried your husband are just outside the door. Can we read together? Who killed him? You're not, you're not still sure. This is someone saying, your husband just died right now. Eh? Namikila, did he? The people will carry and just come out. Because you've lied against me, they will carry you out too. Next verse. Instantly, she fell to the... <laughs> Peter killed these guys, not, Jesus, not God. The, the move of God. Peter just used the power anyhow. Guy has short-tempered anger issues. Exactly, oh, say Peter away Jesus. Three times Peter denied Jesus. Three times. 
like people said, if Ananias and Sapphira had lied to Jesus, they would have died. Because Peter, that killed these guys, lied to Jesus. No, not, what am I saying? Denied Jesus three times. Once, twice, th three times. But what did Jesus say? Peter, I have prayed for you. That is how to show love. But you now, you're rich, you're your killer. Peter, don't show love. Oh. See, see, see the message translation. Message translation is very petty. Peter responded, what is going on here, Mr. Macaroni? That you connive to conspire against the spirit of the master, the men who buried your husband are at the door, and you are next. Can you ah? Jody, angry, angry, jo ah. No sooner we are the words of his mouth than she fell down dead. After this event, give me verse 11 in NLT. 11 and 13. See. You see this word there? Eh? You know, worry, it's not if they grip you. <laughs> if they hold you tight. <laughs> now, so fear do them all. See. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Verse 13. Verse 13. Brush this here. They're not going to come to church again. They say, ah, well, that's not kicking. I want to keep on our church. I don't come away. <laughs> Do you understand? No one dared to join. They're not born there. Right? They're not fit. After you don't keep person, because it's, it lies small lie. Ah, and they go. <laughs> Why are you talking smart now? Pastor, you're kidding me. <laughs> See, and this is not the character of God. God did not send the son to die for people to be running away from him. God cannot be killing people to bring people. He already killed someone that people might come in. God already killed his son Jesus that people might come in. He cannot be killing Anas and Sapphira using that as a medium for people to come into the church. This is not the character of God. This is how I know that this is not God who killed them. I'm so sure. Bring your, sorry, give me a message translation. Mm. Sorry. See, see, see. But even though people admire them a lot, outsiders were weary about joining them. They, they, they fear. And grace doesn't, grace doesn't repel, grace attracts. So if right here, the church is repelling the people, this is, it wasn't God who operated this. Do you understand that? This thing is so clear that you need the pastor to tell you otherwise and you'll be believing. Because now I can do dread now, you know they believe me. I know they read me now, I don't do dread now. I'll be a pastor of the word. Guys, though, you guys, though. You guys, though. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, all I just said was introduction, so let's go into the body of the message. <laughs> Jesus. And I saw this in the V. I don't need to for long. I don't need to speak, though. <laughs> Hallelujah. So let's know what are the things we. <laughs> you guys should be careful. <laughs> so, what are the things we rejoice about as believers? Because. The topic of this night meeting is joy in the Holy Ghost. Oh my God. Come and say it again. I have joy in the Holy Ghost. See, I want to, <laughs> I want to say something now. If you don't have it, don't repeat after me. See, I have physical joy and spiritual joy. Do, do you have physical joy? You said so. It's not me that said so. I'm only speaking for myself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, I mean, let's see the things that we rejoice about as believers. I wrote in my notes here that the things we rejoice about are the things that makes us stand out as believers. 
See, our joy walk cannot be on the same level with unbelievers. Unbelievers rejoice about cars. If that is all we rejoice about, what makes us stand out as believers? If unbeliever, re, unbelievers rejoice about the new private jet he just got, and even if a believer got the same. I mean, so what is now the special rejoicing about? What is, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Let's see Jesus. Jesus placed, Jesus gives us the right perspective to our rejoicing. Luke 10, 17 to 20. I love what Jesus did here. Oh my God. So Jesus had just sent his 70 disciples to go preach the gospel, to go on missionary journey, you know, to go heal the sick, raise the dead, do all manner of miracles, and they were giving their missionary reports to Jesus. And the 70 returned again with joy. Why is this gay name always appearing in this scripture? And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Next verse. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall down from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by enemies hurt you as powerful as all these things are. Jesus amazed me. Next verse. He said, notwithstanding, in this, rejoice not. Uh -uh. Jesus, really? <laughs> rejoice not that the spirit are subject unto you. Jesus is saying, I want a small issue. I beheld Satan fall as a lightning. Now, small issue. Mm -mm. That shouldn't be the reason why you are jumping. Uh -huh. Satan, that small boy. No. You heal the sick. Mm. That's, yeah, it's good, but that's not the big deal. This is the big deal. But rather, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Glory! What? See? Things we rejoice in are of eternal value. Not uh, mm -mm. but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Is see now permanent marker they use right now. It cannot be erased. See, I say this all the time. If your salvation can be lost, there is no way Jesus is telling us to be rejoicing. It's written there, it's intact. I said earlier, you are rapturable. It is not, it's not, it's not negotiable. You go, go heaven. It's sure. Die. Hey, come on now. It's sure die because somebody died. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Of eternal value. Not a so, so it's, it's, it pains me when I see church organizations. See, I, I, I'm always reluctant to call them church because the word church is very powerful. It's not something we should be playing with. The Bible says, upon the revelation of Jesus, my church shall be built. So I tell, I, I'm always reluctant to call those gatherings church. I call them maybe organization or just meeting or conference. So it's painful that in those conference meetings, uh, sorry I'm showing shit, but it's just the truth. <laughs> Save you wicked so. In those board meetings, they've exalted the thing Jesus said we should not rejoice over. That now becomes the order of the day. I was, I mean, I won't mention the, the name of the church nor the pastor's name, but it was, I was... I was thrown off balance when I was passing through. Um, if I mention the name of the location, it can decode the church. I was passing through Lake Express, West, um, Lake Express Expressway and Dagada Expressway, and I saw 
a billboard in front of a church that says, glory to God, um, God just healed one woman of 10 years, is it five blood or something, just one, one woman is what you put on a billboard as a catch to bring people to church. Rejoice not in these things. And it's funny how we don't even we don't even value testimonies of salvation again. It's just so crazy. How someone comes to church now and she was like and she's like, Oh Father, thank you. I just got born again today. I'm like, oh, ah, hallelujah. Ah, thank God. Ah, okay. But when someone comes and says, with the baritone voice, hallelujah, glory to God. So I just got a G wagon of 2020. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Igwe, rejoice not in these things. Exactly. Jesus gives us the right perspective to our rejoicing. This is how we become mature as believers. When the things we rejoice about are not carnal things. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad to have the fat billion accounts. I want it to because I want to take care of my girlfriend, you know. I want it to because I want to preach the gospel. So I want to travel abroad. I want to travel abroad. I want to preach the gospel in private jet. I want to travel private jet. I want those things too. I want to have mansions. I want it too. So le- le- I-, I don't want you to feel like, ah, it's not a poor pastor. No, I want those things too. Trust me. I want the billion flow too. <laughs> Joe, you're giving, I know that God, I know that I have some billions in my future. Just give me like one million dollars out of it. Uh, just, <laughs> just God, try me and see. Um, no, 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 it's not God. I, I, want to see, I want to see if, I want to see something. Uh, I, want to, I want to know if maybe if you give me the money, I'll deny you. Just give, give me the money first. Uh, prove me now. <laughs> you know, I, I want those things too. But if you should believe the Bible, let's believe it to the core. Rejoice not in these things. As powerful, as as good as having a good car is, rejoice not in these things. As good and as blessed and as wonderful and appealing is having a mansion is, rejoice not in these things. Now, Jesus even left material things and even went to the seemingly spiritual things. And even if you raise the man from the dead, rejoice not in these things. Even if you hear the sick, rejoice not in these things. I, I read something powerful in the scripture and it blew my mind. Where we just read it. The Bible says, heaven rejoices over one sinner that repents. What? People, and people just see salvation as something casual, but the Bible says heaven rejoices over them. Now, watch this. Heaven does not rejoice when you heal the sick. As powerful as it is. Why? Because it can be duplicated. Right? The guy can fall sick again. Thank you. Anybody can heal the sick. The devil too can heal the sick. How about they heal sick? Forget. That's why heaven can rejoice over that. As powerful as that is. As powerful as raising the dead is. Heaven doesn't rejoice over that. Hey. Jesus. Because I believe he's trying to. Oh, I, I, I refuse to go there. <laughs> But as powerful as raising the dead is, 
Heaven doesn't rejoice over that. We've seen in African Magic Roba how either the Shongo or the Herbalist, you take a dead child to the person, they do their whatever incantation, the guy comes back to life. So heaven cannot be rejoicing over because God knows that this thing can be faked. It can be, can yeah. Yes, it's, it's because it's, 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 if you've been as an counterfeit, it's, heaven can, that's not the reason why heaven rejoices. But heaven rejoices when a man is saved. See, this would give you some kind of joy. I am saved. It's, if heaven is rejoicing over me, I rejoice over myself. I am blessed with all spiritual blessings. I am redeemed. I am delivered. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Things of eternal value. This is how why this. I mean, you will just wake up in the morning and shout, Glory! And, and someone looks at you. Ah. Because in, in a carnal mind, when that kind of thing happened, the next thing, ah, Alpha, show me the last now, show me the last. A carnal mind cannot discern the things of the Spirit. But when they ask you, ah, brother, why are you rejoicing? Because my name is written in heaven. Because my name is written in heaven. Because I'm eternally saved. Because I have been delivered from the powers of darkness. And I've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Because I have been called light. The person said, look, you say, so no day my level. Yes, you are not in their level. A light. I'm going to leave there. I don't mind those guys. And I was saying something like, it's funny how we've exalted materialism in the church above, the, above salvation. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That means Jesus values the soul of a man over the riches of the world put together. You know, rich. That's how God, see, people said this, it's not a cliche. If it was just one man here on earth, Jesus would still have died. That is how he values the salvation of one man. We don't play with that. We are grateful for that. Hallelujah. See, I'm grateful for salvation. I'm grateful for salvation. That my name is written in heaven, I'm grateful. And in this reality, I rejoice. Come and rejoice. Your names are risen in heaven. Let me rush this soul. Woo. I feel the presence of the Lord already. Oh, I have the joy of the Holy Ghost. These things, it's not what money can buy. Eternal value. I have joy unspeakable. Out of my belly shall flow rivers of living waters. It flows from the inside of me. With joy, I draw from the wells of salvation. In the Old Testament, David prayed for, for God to restore unto him the joy of salvation. In the New Testament, we joy we draw from the wells of salvation. David was praying in the Old Testament, God restore the joy of my salvation. But in the New Testament, we joy, we draw from the wells of salvation. I'm not trusting God to restore our joy. No. Our joy is unspeakable, it's unending. It doesn't diminish. David was not born again. David was not born again. If you tell you, you are not born again when you said that. The carnal man cannot receive the things of the Spirit. David was a carnal man. What's the kind of man? Why not guys? So the first thing we should rejoice about, you know, we should rejoice in our salvation. Perspective. See, this second one I want to show you in. He had, but by the spirit it is easy. But in the flesh, he had. I won't lie to you. I'm a pastor and I'm a man of God. Man first before of God. He had. <laughs> Jesus. James 1 and verse 2. Hmm. Hmm. 
Are you sitting already? Ha. It is not hard. But by the Spirit, it is easy for us. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Ah! That you should count it as, a, as an opportunity to rejoice when you are in the face of trials and temptations. Put the mic on that thing that you played the song. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That means when life throws its blow at you, don't respond with your feeling. Respond with your nature, which is joy. You are joyful always. See, this joy that we have, the world didn't give it, the world cannot take it from us. It is a conviction that this thing, eh, we die here. Nothing can steal my joy. Give me the NLT. Give me the NLT. Hmm. Hmm. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Ah. See, this is where spiritual maturity comes in. This is where we, we, we differentiate the boys from the men. When troubles of any kind comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. And we see this thing practical in the script. See, this is where the practicality of Christian, Christianity comes in. This is where we practice Christianity actually. In Acts chapter 5, verse 41. Acts 5, 41. See, the apostles, they've just been persecuted for preaching the gospel. But watch this. And they departed from the presence of the council. How? How? That they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. This is, it doesn't come by head knowledge. It's a revelation. Give me um, James 1, 2 in the TPT. Let's explain it. Like, my fellow brethren, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties... See it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy you can. Come on. When you're faced with life challenges, see it as the greatest opportunity to experience the greatest joy you can. You can't let life situations bring you down. You respond with rejoicing. You respond with rejoicing. See, joy is not a feeling, neither is it a mood. Joy is a revelation. Joy is not situational. Joy is not conditional. Joy is revelational. That you know that my joy is intact. Even if I face the realities of life, nothing can steal my joy. I have joy unspeakable. I have the joy of the Lord regardless. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, and I wrote this in my note that when you fall into some situations in life, it's not the time to be moody. It's time to be joyful. Do you understand? When you fall into some life situation, that is not the time to be moody. That is the time to be joyful. Joy is a weapon. Pick up the sword of joy and see, sweet, change it for the devil. The devil, the, the devil brings some attacks at you and it feels like you are going to respond with your mood. Respond with joy. Respond with joy. See, the believer in Christ doesn't have mood swings. The man has joy streams. We don't have mood swings. I've stopped saying that thing years ago. I am bored. Uh -uh. Believer, full of the Holy Spirit, you are bored. What are you doing with the Holy Spirit? I'm bored. Me. I've collected our man to stop saying that thing beside me. I am bored. What are you doing to the Holy Spirit? The Bible calls him the comforter. You and when, huh? You are bored. How? Bored must wear on. 
believer in Christ doesn't have mood swings. He has joy streams. Joy flows from the inside of him, from the inside of him. <laughs> you guys, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Are you learning something tonight? Are you learning something tonight? If there's something you want to take home this night, is when you fall into some temptations in life. It's not the time to be moody. It's time to be joyful. Stand up, let's close. Hallelujah.